Right, Bob, let's start with a question. I drove by the Pentagon late last night and again early this morning outside. A great deal of activity around the clock. What's the latest on the search effort and the recovery effort outside? Well, the search effort, of course, is producing a continuing addition to the bad news. Uh, they're estimating that there will be 188 people who will be found dead in the Pentagon, including those who are on the airplane. They are now up to 86. Overnight, they found one more body. The remains now are at 86. Of course, the families were allowed to come by the building yesterday, uh, supported by a lot of uh, grief counselors and the like, to establish a makeshift memorial of flowers and balloons. As as they uh, continue the vigil, the vigil which of course has such a sad ending to this story and of course the story goes on in other parts of the building with the military planning job. Bob, we just had a retired general, Tom McKierney, on the air a short time ago. He was talking about the various options using Diego Garcia, using ground troops going through Pakistan. Any sense over there of the depth and the level of the military planning underway at this hour? Uh, it's intense, no question about it. Uh, the first thing they are dealing with, of course, is the placement of the reserve units and the selection of which specific units are going to be included in the call-up of 35,000 units involving all the Defense Department forces and the Coast Guard, which is under another cabinet department. Those plans are being out the individuals and the units are being notified they're going to be used for homeland defense of course that is not the main focus the main focus is the retaliation and as we found out yesterday the administration's plan to wage a long quote war against terrorism but that's going to involve as the general said many things it's going to involve very surgical operations but sometimes the brute force that the United States can have with its two and a half million plus members of the military Another thing the president and I'm sure the Pentagon would very much like is continued evidence of strong public support. Any sense over there? The president obviously used the words, we're at war yesterday. Blunt statement trying to prepare the American people. Any effort over at the Pentagon as well to try to build public support, even as they get about the nuts and bolts of military planning? Well, it seems quite businesslike here, but the Pentagon sort of goes through these cyclical uh, periods of uh, support. And then, of course, there was a period when uh, there was anything but support. And oftentimes right now, the military is just ignored. But at the moment, uh, the morale at the Pentagon is high in the sense that it realizes it has a mission, there's a focus, and uh, so the, the people at the Pentagon feel like that they are really now the most relevant organization in government, and that's the sense you get as you talk with them. All right, Bob Franken standing by at the Pentagon. We thank you very much. Now, as the president tries to build an international coalition to fight what he bluntly calls a war, European countries are showing their support for the United States in the wake of Tuesday's attacks. A ceremony held today at the Rota Air Nav Naval Base in southern Spain. That base was used as a key staging point for troops and equipment during the Persian Gulf War. Today's ceremony honored the victims of Tuesday attacks and sent the message that Spain stands ready to fight with the United States. Now back to Paula Zahn in New York. Uh, John, uh, before I, I let you go, I know I've had a lot of questions for you today, and, and a large number of folks in our audience have questions, too, to, to ask you and to ask Bill Hemmer and our other correspondents that are going to be with us throughout the morning. Uh, so right now, I'm gonna, I just wanted to prepare you for that, John. Uh, I wanted to put up on the screen right now an email address where you can email your, your questions for, for us to answer. We'll, we'll take a stab at them. Um, at attack at CNN.com. Uh, we would love uh, to handle uh, as many of them as we could get to, so please join us in the 8 o'clock hour uh, for that. Um, just some quick New York notes here. Um, we have learned that St. Patrick's Cathedral, which of course is uh, the largest cathedral here in New York City, will be holding a, a special mass tonight at 530 to honor all of those whose lives uh, have been lost here in the city and then again tomorrow night at 5:30, a, a special uh, service will be held uh, to honor specifically the firefighters the police and uh, the rescue workers who have lost their lives and those that continue to face enormous risks um, as they go about their job I uh, wanted to quickly show you a shot of the Statue of Liberty this morning uh, the World Trade Centers of course used to be uh, the tallest buildings in New York City now the Statue of Liberty has that moniker uh, apparently, there is such a strong, they, they're, uh, well, actually, I haven't seen the Empire State Building yet, but uh, nevertheless, it's uh, not too far here from our CNN platform in, in Midtown Manhattan, but uh, apparently, people uh, have lined up over the sa last several days and waited in line for, for a long time to get up to the observation desk, a deck that is, to, to get their view of uh, the scene uh, south of here. 
Uh, right now, I'm going to head to Afghanistan, where our uh, reporter Steve Hartigan is standing by with the very latest from there. Uh, what are the latest developments this morning? Paul, well, a very dramatic day here in northern Afghanistan. This is about 5% of the country. It's still controlled by the opposition. These people are fighting the ruling Taliban uh, from Kabul. A very dramatic day here because today they buried their leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the Afghani general who fought the Soviets and then fought the Taliban, was assassinated recently. He was assassinated immediately before the terrorist attacks against the United States. His supporters here say the two events are linked. They are calling for military intervention by the United States in Afghanistan, and they say they want to play a role in that coming fight that perhaps might happen against the Taliban. Paula? Steve, realistically, what kind of role could they play? Well, they estimate their own forces at about 15,000 regulars and perhaps about 15,000 more fighters who, who would join the fight. Uh, they are saying that they have experience in fighting the Taliban and in locating uh, Taliban officials, that they have been fighting the Taliban for years, that they have lost thousands of their own people in the fight, and that they would want to play a role as Afghanis in the fight. But realistically, uh, they are in a tough position. They've been driven back here to the north. They control just about 5% of this incredibly remote region. Uh, and they say so far contacts with the United States have been minimal, but they are calling for strikes, for military strikes against their own nation. Paula? Steve, even as familiar as these rebel leaders are with the geography of Afghanistan, uh, do they acknowledge as well, as much as they'd like to help, how difficult it will be to isolate Osama bin Laden and his followers? Certainly they do acknowledge how difficult it is. And the fighting here has been going on, as you know, for decades, the on and off war between the Northern Alliance here and the Taliban. And also before that, as you remember, the Soviet Union tried for 10 years to fight here and win. As we see a helicopter fly by us now, they've been buzzing by all day. All around these villages, you see the scarred remains of Soviet tanks, Soviet armored personnel carriers, really monuments to the failure of trying to fight a war in Afghanistan. Steve, uh, given where you are in the country, I don't know how much uh, reaction from Afghanis you've been able to, to process, but uh, what can you tell us about the Pakistanis now saying uh, that, that they are urging the Taliban to uh, deliver Osama bin Laden to them sometime within the next three days. We know a high-level delegation from Pakistan will actually be traveling to Af Afghanistan to deliver that ultimatum. Right. Well, as on the part of the Northern Alliance, that's the opposition group here that controls about 5% of the country, there's really a great deal of skepticism towards Pakistan. Uh, they see Pakistan really as an extension of the Taliban, really as the enemy. They have, we've spoken to high officials here among the opposition, and they are giving clear to the United States, do not trust Pakistan. As a matter of fact, they say one way to close down the Taliban, one of the most successful ways of fighting against the Taliban, according to them, would be to close the supply of arms from Pakistan to the Taliban. So some real sharp warnings here from the Afghan opposition not to trust Pakistan. Paula? Steve, I know earlier this morning Tom Mentir was reporting that now that there is an expectation that there will be war, he was reporting from Islamabad, uh, Pakistan, uh, that uh, perhaps as many as a couple hundred thousand people will try to flee Afghanistan. Have you seen any signs of people trying to get out? Well, here from the north, we have not seen signs of refugees trying to flee. It's almost on the contrary here. We've seen a real hope, a real expectation of moving forward. The fighters here say, although their numbers are limited, that they want to move forward towards Kabul, that they hope that this crisis could prove an opportunity for them, an opportunity to retake at least a greater share of what they say is their country. Steve Harrigan, thank you so much for that latest update. We will get back to you throughout the morning. Right now, I head back to Atlanta, and that's where Miles continues to stand by with more on uh, what this war effort might look like. Hi, Miles. Hello, Paula. Leaders in several countries have pledged their support to the United States. This morning, CNN's chief international correspondent, Christiane Amanpour, spoke with British Prime Minister Tony Blair. 
He said Britain stands strong with the U.S. in the face of terrorism. I'm very pleased at the way that America and the American administration has gone out of its way to consult its allies, to keep us fully informed so that we are part of the deliberations they're making. But we have to do two things, in my view. First of all, there has to be a response to bring those terrorists who committed this attack to account, and we will play our full part in that. And secondly, there has then to be an agenda that we construct at an international level that involves the whole of the international community in dismantling the machinery of international terrorism, how it's financed, um, how these people move about the world, uh, the countries that then harbour them and give them help. At every single level, we have to pursue and dismantle this machinery of terror. And that is important, not just for the purpose of bringing those people to account, but also in order to make sure that this does not happen again. Well, we've made it very clear that we stand side by side with the United States. And it's not a question of the United States simply saying, this is what we're going to do now, come and join us. The US is um, in close consultation with us and with other allies. And I think there will be a very broad support for a response that allows us to pursue and bring to account those responsible for this act and do it as an act of justice. It's fairly clear where the evidence is tending, but I think it is important that we consider the evidence in a very careful way, that it's factually based, uh, that we are hard-headed about it, but once we have come to a conclusion, then it is important that we hold those people who are responsible for this, as I say, to account. And I think you will find, incidentally, that that is the view right around the world. I've spoken to Arab leaders in the past few days that have expressed their outrage at what has happened, their determination that this should be seen as something that the world of Islam is standing against, uh, not merely countries like America and the United Kingdom. And I think you will find that there is enormous support for the idea that we must put together a broad-based coalition that hound these people down and that bring them to account and do it, as I say, for reasons of justice. We, we owe it to those people that lost their lives, to their families who are grieving, and to our own defense of democracy and liberty and freedom. The terrorist attacks have sparked a flame of patriotism in a generation of Americans unaccustomed to displaying pride in their country or their government. CNN's Jason Bellini with that. For a generation accustomed to fleeting fashion statements, for the moment, it's hip to be wearing the flag. We drove in and uh, we were saying we've never even done this on the 4th of July, like get dressed up. Young people are flocking to nightly vigils around New York City, expressing a mix of emotions, including one that many from the X and Y generations have never felt before, patriotism, pride in being American, pride in their government. I know in my particular case I've had a lot of issues with the U.S. government in the past. I mean, I'm gay and they don't do a very good job, I think, of you know, supporting and including their gay citizens. And this is the first time I've really been able to look at the government in an, you know, important situation and say they're doing a great job and I'm, you know, I'm glad to have them. Older Americans have long wondered, do these kids have it in them? The love of country, the willingness to sacrifice. Having grown up in safe and privileged times, the under 30 crowd admits they've never been tested. As a generation, we don't really have anything that brings us together because there's, there hasn't been a one world event that would do it for us. Older Americans also have wondered whether their MTV generation compatriots know how to be serious, to not be cynical. Do young people care about anything other than that which directly affects them? MTV apparently thinks so. It switched to network news coverage the day of the disaster. This is really unprecedented television. TRL, the popular video countdown program with host Carson Daly, for the first time in its history, played not a single video. Let's celebrate the gift of life. You hear a lot of kids, you know, all like, oh, the government sucks and blah, blah. But right now, I, I'm very proud to be, you know, a voting member of our United States government. Will the ADD generation lose interest quickly? MTV News reporter John Norris thinks not. The idea of sacrifice, the idea of a, a threatening world is, is it's foreign to them. And I'm afraid that this week may be on the brink of a real fundamental change in the kind of world we live in. You know, I pretty much like the ways of America and like people around here and just America itself. Today, there was, you know, there was no reason not to be proud of the whole thing because of how people reacted to it, you know. For the younger generation, patriotism stoked not necessarily by tragedy itself, but by the way Americans react when the time comes. 
Jason Bellini, CNN, New York.